Imagine you are coming to school one day as you normally do, not knowing what is coming ahead. While returning back home, you get an emergency alert on your phone. There is a major flood coming ahead. Please be careful if you stay in a low-lying flood-prone area. You end up going back home only to realize it is destroyed and you don't have anything to go back to. What are you going to do next? What do you think the people who actually suffer from this must be doing? Do they have the guide, the resources to act on it? New York City, a symbol of resilience. Yet, a rising threat lurks beneath its surface. Coastal flooding, as storms intensify and sea levels rise, our coastline becomes increasingly vulnerable. Far Rockaway, Queens, a vibrant community, bears the brunt of this crisis. Underserved and often overlooked, its residents feel the impacts of flooding most acutely. Families lose homes, businesses crumble, lives are disrupted. The suffering may be hidden, but it runs deep within communities like Far Rockaway. Yet, hope persists. Within local communities lies the strength to not only recover but to shape a more resilient future. This is where community engagement becomes vital. By giving communities a voice in the decision-making process, we ensure solutions address their unique needs and priorities. From immediate response to long-term rebuilding, community knowledge is invaluable. The golden hour, that critical window after a disaster, before larger aid arrives. It's a time for trust building and tapping into a community's capacity for self-help. Culturally sensitive communication is essential during this period, fostering collaboration and faster recovery. Imagine a world where those often left behind become leaders in the face of adversity. By empowering underserved communities like Far Rockaway, we forge a path to a more just and resilient New York. For all, let's embrace the golden hour and build a future where every voice is heard and every community has the power to shape its destiny. Good evening, everyone. Uh, we are team Nordstar, and this is our project, The Rising Tide. I would like to introduce you to my team, Oz, Kaishin, Jeff, and myself, Raghavendra. And these are our main values. And we are advised by Dr. Denise Tahara. For the past one year, we have been developing an inclusive framework uh, for community-driven disaster response called FOSS, that is First Order Response Community Engagement. The framework has the potential to empower underserved communities facing, facing various types of calamities. This framework has the potential, uh, although we have piloted this uh, project for coastal flooding, this framework can be used for any type of disasters and in any underserved communities at, at, at world level, optimizing response and resilience. What do you see when you look at these pictures? This was the effect of Hurricane Sandy in 2012. Coastal cities, coastal neighborhoods all in all five boroughs of New York City were underwater. Why this is important is because Sandy was a wake up call for the vulnerability of coastal cities to extreme weather. It has led to critical decisions being made for uh, actions on climate change adaption and resiliency. Talking about the impact it led to, there were approximately 13 million people affected by this uh, hurricane directly and indirectly, and with an estimated damage of $19 billion with which 55% of the damage was for low-income renters with an average income of only $18,000. With what we know here, we can see that by 2060, more than 400,000 people will be at risk of major flooding that will have a direct impact on their lives. The Federal Emergency Management of the United States built a 100-year floodplain map that, that map to assess the flooding situation. As intimidating as these uh, maps look, this concept is as easy as an overflowing bathtub, where you can the water doesn't just stay in the tub, it spills all over the edges and into the surrounding floor. This is very similar to what a floodplain is. It is a land that is surrounded by a water body and takes the brunt of the overflow when water levels rise due to global warming. So the data gathered on the floodplains 
during the discovery stage of a process lays the foundation for the entire force framework. With this, our pilot location is the rockaways, which you can see in the image, and it, which is one of the most affected areas in New York City. Now let's zoom into the circle and look at the rockaways. The economic disparity between the East and the West is seen with the income difference visible here, with the West having, having, an, income uh, having an income of $135,000 and the East having a median income of, with the lowest being $35,000. It is not just the economic, but also the demographic difference that can be seen, which leads to disparity in the allocation of resources during emergencies and in turn increases their overall damage and recovery time. With everything that we have researched in the discovery stage, the challenge that we have defined is underserved and geographically vulnerable communities experience significant disparities during flood events, with which we are targeting SDG 13.3. And this system in inequity prolongs recovery, creating cascading negative effects on entire communities as a whole. And with this, we are targeting SDG 10.3, which is reducing inequalities. I would like to hand over to Kaishin for the next steps. So thank you, Lavu. So our all the research, <coughs> sorry, all the other research is built on our research questions. So which is how can community engagement strategies be tailored and addressed to the diverse need of the vulnerable communities to enhance their performance in the disaster preparedness and response. So after we have our research question set up, we started thinking, are there any existing like community plan to help them to be prepared for the flood? We, what we got is this one, which called the FEMA Community Lifelines. What you are saying is their current reporting system. So what you can you ask at the first time you look at? What I say is about the White House. I only see one how or least in the, a lot of news and how they how now they are showing up in a community level reporting system. How long does it a community report go into a desk on the White House? And how many information gonna be there? They ha definitely have a missed opportunity about the uh, time efficiency and also the overload about the information. So another uh, example in the same report, which is this one. On the right, you can see a design tree to help the community to identify their uh, situation in about their lifelines. So you can see they are perfectly done by different colors. About the, some are in the gray, some are in the green, some are in the red. So what are missing? The community understand their situation now. So what missing is how can community do next from a green community to become a red one, from a red one to become a yellow one. So. So what are we are targeting? We are targeting is called golden hour. It's right after the flood hit and right before the any helps from the federal level or state level comes. This this golden hour actually gives the of unique opportunity for the leverage of the internal resources that community has to help them start the self rescue immediately. So. After this, we start to like, identify what are the resources that the rockways can achieve, which we build this uh, Arthur map. We divided them into five different areas, which is institutions, associations, physical spaces, and the local business economies make authors and also the collaborator and the complementers. So you can see there have a, a organization showing you a lot, which is RISE. So who are they? RISE stands for the Rockway Initiative for the Sustainability and the Equity, which they start their organization with by the community for the community. And they are doing really great job on the engaging and evolving with the young and adults. They have a past event which called the Greater Rockways, which is a coastal resilience plan, which help us to get our project a lot. So I will hand over to the Oz to talk about our model force. Thanks, Kaishin. So having defined our problem, we went into designing our solution, FORCE, uh, which is a strategic tool uh, that helps communities. It provides a framework to communities to make agile decisions and leverage their internal resources uh, during the golden hour. And the way it's set up is there are uh, different roles uh, on, the, on the tool that are pre-assigned. And there are four main pillars, as well as one command pillar that is all led by the lead mitigator who's the leading person. And the command here would be a monitoring and an incident command role where uh, the, the, that person would oversee 
the entire activities uh, being taking place. Now let's look into the pillars. So the first pillar is assess where all assessment activities will be taking place. Uh, you, you might wanna start from this pillar, but not necessarily because this is a framework for decision-making. Uh, so wherever uh, decision-making is needed, you will refer to it, the community will refer to it. But the assessments tool uh, pillar uh, who is led by the assessor and two other roles, allocator and the prioritizer, are responsible for risk assessment, vulnerability mapping, and defining urgency levels. And let's move on to the next one. The next one would be source, which is sourcing everything the community needs, uh, you know, the critical resources they need uh, for survival. And there are, again, three roles assigned here. Uh, the provider would be leading, and the caretaker and the allocator would be supporting. And I'd like to also emphasize that the roles on the corners are connecting, so they connect pillars together to allow a fast communication. And the third one is communicate, which is very important in disaster response uh, because tasks uh, such as identifying the communication channels and resource planning and especially disinformation management are very critical. And this role also has, this pillar also has three roles assigned that ensure a, a fast and effective communication uh, across, across the task force. And the final one would be relocation, which uh, is again, a very critical uh, pillar. You know, the way we designed this tool is we tried to include everything a community might need to make decisions on uh, during that critical time frame. So here we also have three roles, the relocator, the operator, and the prioritizer. So uh, just to do a deep dive into what these pillars uh, how these pillars expand. There will be decision trees. This is a very vague, high-level uh, example for how it might look like. Case-based uh, decision trees will be included in these pillars, and these pre-assigned roles will have their own work streams, and they'll be responsible uh, to make these decisions uh, you know, uh, within the context of the framework. And now I will hand it over to Jay for the implementation plan. Thank you, Rose. So uh, now that we know about force, how do we plan to implement it with, with a community like the Rockaways? So we have laid out a roadmap with six phases spanning 12 to 18 months. First phase would be identifying resources and personnel. So we saw the asset map that Kaishin put up. We would do a comp comprehensive inventory of the community assets and people in the, in, in the community. We identify locations that could serve as evacuation shelters in, in the event of a coastal flooding event, uh, distribution centers or communications hub. Uh, and using that inventory, we build a usable database that could that could turn information into a tool that allows for a quick decision during a crisis, like coastal flooding. Secondly, phase two would, would entail community engagement and partnership building. We build a resident team, recruit passionate members from the community of the Rockaways, in this case, and partner for impact. We establish long-term relationships with communities like organizations like RISE uh, for a important response, and we connect the network, we link community groups, faith-based organizations, hospitals, schools, uh, community groups like RISE, for greater power than they could have by themselves. Phase three entails training and capacity building. We equip members from practical skills, decision-making frameworks, and each role within the force uh, net framework, as Oz mentioned, would get a tailored manual on how and what to do when, when the event occurs. We foster men mentorship. We pass down the experience to create a lasting culture of preparedness, so every, every generation knows uh, what to do when, when, when calamity, cla sorry, calamity hits. And we learn from the past, involve seasoned responders, first responders, and residents who have lived through disasters to help community, uh, you know, gain knowledge from their experience. Phase four is, is standard testing and simulation. We practice for the unpredictable, test the plans, adapt them based on realistic scenarios. I have an analogy for this. Think of it as force as a crew for an airline. The crew is prepared for any, any sort of calamity that might happen when the, when the aircraft is up in the air. And this is exactly what force will, it will entail for, for those community members as a part of the force framework. We involve the community, include residents as observers to build trust and gather wider feedback from, uh, with a special focus on populations like person, people with disabilities and seniors. And we learn from the lessons of the drill, analyze what worked, what didn't. We go back to the drawing phase, and this is a uh, cyclical process. So we go back on the 4D uh, model for deliver. Uh, we, discover, we discover new stuff, we design, we implement it, and we deliver it again. Phase five involves 
integration and communication, we formalize protocols, force emergency management like FEMA, RISE, and partnered community organizations to create coordinated responsibility. So think of it as a baton race, force hands off to FEMA, and that's how we, we ensure that there's a proper coverage at all times and smooth handoffs. And we build this, this, this uh, framework as a part of the community's year on mindset so they are prepared for whenever the calamity is to uh, come to the shores. And finally, phase six is monitoring, evaluating, and refining the force, phase, force framework. We measure our success uh, along with the KPIs that uh, was mentioned in, in each of the pillars. We see adaptable, continuously refine the force framework and prove our impact to both communities uh, for, for other calamities such as uh, earthquakes or, or, or um, you know, uh, wildfires in California or something like that. And I would like to leave you all with a quote that encompasses our project and solidify the belief that communities and people on the, on the ground have the wisdom that nobody else can. Thank you. Thank you. And for those who just joined us, there are some seats in the front. I'm so sorry for putting you in on the spot, but I don't want to see anyone uncomfortable. And um, right now, if you have any questions, please let me know and I'll pass you the mic. Um, can you open your slide for decision tree yes. case? the last one yeah uh in that uh like how can you like without referring to the previous actions how can you like work on the like future goals like uh this one maybe i can be wrong but yeah you mean the future uh, like the future tasks how do you so in this case um the idea for this was for, for instance if you're in the assess stage and uh or or any other stage you get new information presented maybe something about relocation it could be something about sourcing and then uh you have to go back and say okay do we need a reassessment here yeah, right yeah. and if you do then you reassess and you decide to move forward there refer to previous actions what we meant here is that maybe you already done uh that task or maybe you can repeat it in order you know in the face of new information and you know it will be business as usual it won't be a problem but if you do need reassessment then you have to go on the other side of the decision tree and as you said to decide uh, on the future work streams that are going to take place yeah no other questions okay This is a little out of the box, but can you just give us some quick understanding of how you'll adapt this framework when you present it at the public health conference? <laughs> Thank you for the question, Mary. Uh, we do need to work on that, but... Um, we obviously are going to be emphasizing the public health aspect of each of the pillars that we are working on. So as we said, we're going to expand on these pillars and have decision trees. We already created an extended document that you know specifies the tasks and details of these roles. So I guess the answer for now, will we be doubling down on the public health aspect and trying to you know the, steer the focus towards that? And you know, whatever we get from that conference, obviously we're going to continue adding it into the tool. So um, that's what we can say for now, I think. At one point to add. So, uh, so in the implementing part also, we also looked at Rockaways in terms of hospitals. So there's only one hos main hospital, which is in the entire area. And what we saw in that, in the relocate part, and also for people who, in terms of emergency, so they have around 450 beds total in that area and for the hospital. But so we looked at different uh, opportunities where we can have alternative camps, like temporary camps for in terms, in terms of emergencies where they can uh, have non-emergency based uh, um, yeah, the centers where uh, in terms of any emergency that there can be there, it can be schools, uh, it can be playgrounds, it can be like areas where we can, we have an area for implementing that part. And we also look at like kits for making kits for them in terms of health kits. So we'll keep them prepared 
and in, whenever the calamity hits, we'll get those there. So that's one aspect of it, I guess. Just last question, uh, and I might have missed this. Did, did you find out how, did you work with communities of faith at all to see how they cohere their communities already and how they might be utilized to implement anything related to force? And it's okay to say no. <laughs> yes, uh, part of the plan we have people from the community of the Alicia's in the, in the house. Uh, so, yeah, as of now, the only community organization we've spoken to is RISE uh, as part of our project uh, in terms of developing the, the framework. And now we're going to go back to RISE and, and pitch it to them. And uh, faith-based organizations are a part of the implementation plan. So, yeah, thank you.